Throughout Lent, we've been doing a series on the anxiety of the sacrifice on Light on the Hill. And I've also been participating, uh, leading a book study on anxiety as well. And I've talked about uh, the process that uh, the anxiety that Abraham would have felt in his story uh, when he was called by God to sacrifice his son. And I've been tying that in a little bit as well with uh, Jesus's own story and his own route to the cross. Uh, and this past week at Palm Sunday, we had talked a little bit more about how the uh, triumphant entry would have been a kind of a point as well of some anxiety for Jesus because he knows what he's about to come. And the entire point of this and the entire goal that I've had with this is to really try and get in allow us all to get in touch with a human aspect of these great, you know, in the case of Abraham, the father of faith, and in the case of Jesus, our own savior, to get in touch with a part of their human side that we don't necessarily think about, which is that they likely would have felt much the way that we do when we see these difficult obstacles in the way in our own lives, you know, and, and react in a way that is anxious and feel that kind of anxiety and dread uh, as we approach something that seems very difficult. Uh, and with that, I have been trying to get us to really follow in their footsteps. And so tonight, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a different service than what I normally do on Sundays and what many of you probably have been experienced out there for a Good Friday service in and of itself. Uh, tonight, I want us to actually do our best uh, to go through and not just experience the story of Jesus's uh, Good Friday itself, of Jesus's crucifixion, uh, but to really feel it, to really feel the way that it would have been on that day all those years ago. And so with that, I invite you all to join me as we go on this journey together. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd. And the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. There is a grove of ancient gnarled trees that exists on the Mount of Olives. It's here that the olive oil used within the temple to purify priests and those who performed duties in front of God was created, was made. The very oil that they would use to anoint these individuals. Uh, the process to do so involves taking those olive fruit and placing them in a press and crushing them down until they're crushed completely, using usually a large stone that they would roll over it. Uh, the reason for this is that the majority of the oil for olive oil is found within the pit, uh, and you have to completely and utterly crush that fruit until it is completely flattened to extract all the oil that would be needed out of it. It's a fitting place then for this scene that we find in scripture, where Jesus, weighed down by the anxiety of what is about to come in, with the end of his very life and his death on the cross, is praying earnestly for God to take this cup from him. 
to take a, to withhold his hand as he did all those years ago with Isaac when he called Abraham to sacrifice his only son. It's here that we see his, so much of his anguish in the middle of the night where it would have been dark and I'm sure shadows might have even tricked his mind into thinking that his pursuers were coming early. It was here that he wrestles with this issue and seeks to with God and find strength. It's here that he finds himself completely alone. His own disciples, his own friends, falling asleep and unable to even spend a few hours up to pray as he is facing this massive task. And of course, there is the coming betrayal. Judas, one of his 12, one of, an individual who I'm sure Jesus did consider a friend, somebody who Jesus, I'm sure, did consider to be a companion, which is why I'm sure it stung when he came with the priests, walked up to him, and betrayed him with a kiss. And yet in all of this, as Jesus' prayer said, all of this was the will of God, was the will of the Father. And we can be thankful that Jesus did follow through with this. Even when his own disciples rose up and struck out at those who would capture him and hand him over to die, we see here in this moment, Jesus reach out and heal the wound that is done. Jesus knew that God had something planned here. And as hard as it was, he took the steps necessary to find the strength to face it and go through it. And it is, of course, the first steps on this journey of his to the cross of this evening. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, a little later someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour still, in another insisted, saying, Certainly, this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, You will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many th other things against him, blaspheming him. When the day came, the assembly of elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Underneath Caiaphas' house is a cell, or perhaps it was originally a cellar, some place to store things. But on this night, it is a cell. Jesus has been taken and has been arrested, but they cannot just merely leave him out in the open. They cannot have him out where his disciples could theoretically rescue him begin a uprising, which many of the high priests believe Jesus was trying to do. And so, underneath Caiaphas's house in the dark, with wounds freshly opened by those who mocked, beat him, and spat on him, Jesus spends his last night in the dark alone. And the next morning, he is pulled up from this 
cell, makeshift cell, and placed in front of the elders. And then because they have questions, they have things that they are wondering about. They know from last, from earlier in the week when Jesus entered into the city, that he was making a claim that he is their king, that he is the coming king. There had been others like him. There would be others like him afterwards. People who claimed to be the Messiah, claimed to be this ruler. All of them led uprisings against the Roman rulers and were utterly and completely squashed. For these religious leaders, I am sure part of their fear was that Jesus was just another one of these. They were blinded by this idea that The Messiah had to be this political figure, this this individual who was going to throw things on its head. And They had already been burned so many times before. They were worried that this would result in something similar, that Rome would come in and maybe this time utterly annihilate them if Jesus did what they thought he was going to do. Of course, they were completely wrong, but they still had to know. There There was still the threat of Jesus, not just in that way, but in towards their own authority as well. He was popular among the people. People followed him. There was tales of him raising the dead. They could not allow him to continue. And so they look for a reason. It's interesting here that Jesus, when finally asked if he is the Son of God, uses the phrase, I am. This is something and that to us, all these years later, we miss the significance of so often. Uh, the truth is, the belief is that the name of God, which was so heavily revered, that the Jews actually replaced the vowels in the word in Scripture so that nobody would ever actually read the real name. It's believed, though, that that name roughly translates to I am. Jesus, by using this term, is making a claim about his divinity. And for these Jewish priests, these Jewish intellectuals and educated individuals, this is what the proof that they needed to bring him to be executed. Because there's no way that he could actually be God. It's here again that they're mistaken. And so... After being beaten, mocked, imprisoned, Jesus is taken from Caiaphas' own house and handed over to Pilate to see what fate will await him. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod. For he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. 
Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. The third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. They were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Pilate had an unenviable position within the Roman Empire. The territory of Judea, of Israel, that he was in charge of, that he was governor of, was infamous for its rebellious people, for its insurrections. And so Pilate found himself in charge of a province that was a powder keg. This meant that he had to rule in a way that simultaneously appeased the various groups and factions within the Jewish people, but also discouraged any types of rebellion with the typical cruelty so common in the Roman world. When Jesus is brought before him then, the immediate question he likely had for himself is, is this man a threat? It is clear from his reaction that he did not think so. We're not sure why. There's nothing in scripture that says anything about why Pilate would have thought that Jesus wasn't a threat. Even the claim that he was the king of the Jews didn't seem to really bother him. Maybe he had heard stories of this teacher who went around and healed and preached about love, or maybe he just took one look at Jesus and knew he's not going to do anything. But it didn't matter, because the high priests had not just brought Jesus with them, they had brought a mob. And so Pilate tries to wash his hands of the situation. He sends Jesus to uh, one of Herod the Great's sons, uh, also named Herod. And after he doesn't come to a ruling, he finds himself in the same position, the same problem. He tries as hard as he can to release Jesus. Uh, I'm sure that for him, the fear is, is if he does what this mob wants, his own followers will rise up and cause an insurrection as well. But with the possibility of a riot on his hands, he eventually relents and hands Jesus over to be crucified. I can only imagine what Jesus was feeling throughout all of this. There probably was a sense of resignation, the sense of things are going to go this way and there's nothing I can really do about it at this point. But then again, there might also have been a sense of just real strength. We do hear that Jesus was strengthened when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it is easy to think that in either case, he had either he had come to some sort of form of acceptance, some sort of form that this was what God had planned, and therefore there is nothing for him to really even worry about at this point. He had a purpose and a mission to accomplish that God had given him, and he was going to do so, even though it would cost him his life. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning, and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For they do these things when the wood is green. What will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, There they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There is also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. 
One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the others rebuked him, saying, Do you, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. On a hill outside of Jerusalem, Jesus was led and crucified. Crucifixion is an absolutely horrible type of execution that has thankfully been annihilated from the Western world. And as a result, we don't necessarily get the full impact of what it really was. The closest comparison in American history is likely lynching, uh, which had a racial component to it that was also somewhat present in crucifixion, but not necessarily to the degree that we would think of it. Crucifixion was meant as a show. It was meant as a message to tell individuals, whatever this person did, you will not do. In the Roman world, they used it specifically for people who were accused of insurrection. The two criminals on either side of Jesus are theorized to have been zealots who likely tried to raise their hands against the Roman war machine and thus were hung up on those crosses as a show to everybody else that if you try to fight back against us, this is what will happen to you. It was a torturous death, a death that was painful and agonizing and could last for days sometimes. Out on a wooden cross, a with splinters, having to push yourself up to take any breath, all while people are watching you, mocking you, weeping for you, all waiting for you to die. And that's where Jesus was, waiting to die on a cross, with some mocking him, some weeping and some demanding for him to do what he might have felt like doing at any point. It's true. Jesus could have at any point throughout all of this called out to heaven and had an entire force of angels come and just wipe out the planet. It would have been justified. And yet he didn't do it. It's clear that Jesus loved us enough that he was willing to go through with this plan of God's, with this will of God's that would allow us to come back into connection with him. It's here that we see that, similar to that story all those years ago in Genesis, where Abraham brings his own son up onto Mount Moriah, binds him, and prepares to sacrifice, that this time, instead of providing a substitute for that sacrifice, God does not withhold his hand. God does strike down his only son so that we may have eternal life. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw that what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation. The Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then he returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. 
Jesus was laid to rest in a tomb like us, like the one behind me, a rock-hewn tomb carved out of a cliffside. And this ends this part of this story. But there's a bigger question that we need to ask, and it's one that I've waited for to the end here, and that is, what does Jesus' death mean to us? I'm going to answer this question in two ways. The first is as the theologian in me, which is to tell you that Jesus' death is the bridge between us and God. It is the restoration of our relationship with God. It's the ultimate sacrifice that washes us of sin and removes the need to constantly be going through with these animal sacrifices that were done for so many years to wash away our sins. It's the completion of that process and promise that he made in the beginning of the coming of his kingdom. But there's another part to this, and it's a personal part. It's something that all of us have to wrestle with. And it's that personal question of what does it mean to me, to me individually? Years ago, when I was in elementary school, I was around third grade, fourth grade. Uh, I it was around Easter, actually. I attended a play. It was on King David. And something about that play convicted me. And so I went up and I ended up praying with one of the a- actors and prayed about you know my own sins in my life, or the sins of an elementary age school kid, as you can imagine. Uh, and something moved in me. Something changed in me, but it wasn't completed. You know, I, I felt like and it stuck with me. It stuck with me through that weekend. And when we actually went to church that Sunday, I found myself up at the altar during worship, uh, during singing of hymns and everything and praying. And the pastor uh, saw me. And of course, you know, elementary school kids up at the front altar is a little bit weird. And <laughs> he knew my family. Uh, So he went up and asked me what I was praying about. And I told him about the play. I told him what I felt. I told him what I was trying to wrestle through. And he brought together the elders around me and of the church around me. And he led me in prayer and I gave my heart to Jesus. And on that day, on that Sunday that I will never forget, I will never forget the details of it. uh, I remember praying that prayer, feeling that there was a great weight on me, and then feeling it lifted and feeling, you know, clean, feeling pure afterwards. And it was at that moment in my life that I began to truly follow Jesus, that I became a Christian, a definitive moment. And this is not to say that things have been perfect since then. I've had my ups and downs in my faith. I've had my moments of, uh, of feeling very close to God and feeling as far away as possible. But throughout it all, I have always, from that point forward, been dedicated in my life to Jesus. And I would like to encourage those of you out there who haven't experienced that, who haven't found that connection, uh, to, to do so, to seek it out. If you're feeling called now, uh, I would like to invite you all to join me in praying. Uh, I'm going to make things very simple for you because I know a lot of times these things, they can feel like, well, what should I say? What should I go about it? So if you'll join me, so if you feel convicted, if you feel like you want or called to give your heart to Christ, join me in praying as, as we close out this service. Lord, we come to you today. We come to you as individuals who know that our own hearts are broken, that our own uh, li- our own way of living has not brought us closer to you or to God. We recognize that all these years ago, you gave your life for us, and we just pray, Lord, that you will come into our lives at this moment, that you will forgive us our sins, that you will help us to come back in connection with God, with you. We pray that I pray that for all those who are praying this prayer for the first time, Lord, I just pray that you will move into their lives, that you will guide them, that you will bring them, that you will get them connected to a church, and that you will help them to follow and live their lives following you. In your name, amen.